Now we're talking about OmniTrace. So OmniTrace is an AMD research project to collect performance information on a program at runtime. So it supports programs written in C, C++, Fortran, and Python, as well as compute frameworks like OpenCL and HIP. So if we want those modules available, we can go to the welcome letter. So go to the welcome letter, and I will just dig out those module load commands. And we can run those to get our OmniTrace modules. All right, so now we're loading all those modules. All right, so now I'm just going to go back one level. We're still in lesson five profiling, and we have loaded the OmniTrace module. So OmniTrace, OmniTrace using the tracing functionality that will collect extra things. So that will collect extra things like CPU um, busyness, as well as power usage um, for your application. So it uses Rockham as far as I'm sorry, Rockprof as far as I'm aware in the background, but it collects extra things. So so Rockprof with the trace will will get you that tracing functionality, and that's fine. But if you want to collect extra things, then OmniTrace um, allows you to do that. So we've got OmniTrace available, and this is how we use OmniTrace on, a, on an application. So you use this command called OmniTrace instrument, and what that will do is that will intercept library calls um, by the application and then it will instrument those uh, then it'll instrument those those library calls for the purpose of profiling. Um, so I'm not sure then if it is using rock prof in the background. Um, but it produces the same, gives you the same sort of answers. Okay, so let's just run that command. So we go OmniTrace instrument, and then we are doing a, a tracing collection now on that on that application. So it's getting um, a little bit dark in here, so I'll just switch on the light. Um, overcast Victorian sky. While we're waiting, um, I think we said before that the Rockham module is a uh, Cray provided module um, because Correct. it doesn't have a version number. When you yes. module load OmniTrace without a version number, it loads the five, Rockham 543. It changes Rockham 502 to Rockham 543. So Yes. If you forget yep. the version number, it's uh, right. very easy to accidentally load the other Rockham. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And um, so it is not, yeah, it's not production ready. Um, yeah, it's not production ready. That production ready version won't, um, yeah, won't have, um, yeah, shouldn't have uh, that sort of issue. Yeah, that's right. So if you don't explicitly have that module load Rockham 5.0.2, then it will load 5.4.3. Okay, so here is, here's the progress of the trace collection. So it looks like it's all working.
Yep, it's still working. There we go. So we're done with, we have finished collecting all of the things. All right, so if you have a look in, if you have a look in this file called on, sorry, if you have a look in this folder called OmniTrace Matmult Profiling Output. So we go to OmniTrace, Trace Mat Malt Profiling Output. There is a collection with the date on it. So there's a folder in here that's got the date of collection. So we go to 2023. Um, and inside that folder is a perfetto trace.proto file. So that proto file um, you can copy back to your machine. And I'm just going to um, I'm just going to use ui.perfetto.dev in the interest of time to open a example trace file that I collected that I collected earlier. So I'll just do that. So I'll collect my trace file. Um, so I'll go so I'll open. And if you if you've got ui.perfetto.dev open, you can go to L5 profiling, and then you can go to OmniTrace example, the example directory, and that's where a sample collection has been placed. So have a look at OmniTrace Metmalt profiling dash output, and then perfetto.trace dot proto. So open that. And this is the Omnitrace output. So you've still got you've still got things um, you still have as before you still have your hip device synchronized. This, you still have your hip host mount. So you still have those functions, but you've got a whole bunch of extra information here, such as um, CPU frequency. So it's gotten the CPU frequency of all 128, um, all 128 hardware threads. It's got uh, memory usage, page faults, peak memory, user time, virtual memory usage, the time that the GPU is busy. Yep, so there's a whole bunch of extra things that were collected with OmniTrace. Yeah, so the upshot is that OmniTrace is collecting a lot more information than just simple rock prof is doing. I'm trying to find trying to find our actual collection for the kernel itself. So hip hip host malik. Okay, hip want kernel. That's not our, yep. So somewhere, somewhere in here is information on our, our kernel. So we've got the CPU functions here. We've got the CPU functions, but um, should have the kernel functions here somewhere. So there's our hip launch kernel. Yeah, so I can't um, I can't find I can't find where it's where it's showing our uh, where it's showing our kernel, but um, 
but suffice to say that uh, Omnitrace, Omnitrace can collect a lot more than than Rock Rock Prof can do. Okay. So another way that you can use Omnitrace is to actually instrument the application itself prior to running. Now this is uh, useful if you want to collect traces, um, but you don't want to um, you don't want to um, have to use a script that calls rock rock prof. Yeah, so what you would use is this Omnitrace instrument. And I think this is um, this is pretty cool because what we can do is we've got our top five profiling. So we've got our matmot profiling code there. And we're going to use this command here, Omnitrace instrument. Okay, so these flags, um, these flags set up this code for um, for instrumentation. So what it will do is actually rewrite your program. So it will go into the binary and rewrite your program, but it will use rewrite the program to use Omnitrace collection um, in instead um, instead of just the normal the normal calls. So this command here will just run that. Omnitrace instrument. So that Omnitrace instrument creates another executable called matmult profiling inst.exe. And then when we run that little command, we can just, so when we run that instrumented application, we can just use Omnitrace run. And so we go Omnitrace run our instrumented application. And so it's done it's done the tracing a lot more quickly as well. So that um, that instrumented application finished the trace a lot more quickly. And the output of that is now in Omnitrace matmult profiling dot inst output. Okay, so you can go ahead and load that file into Perfetto as well. Okay. Um, I'm cognizant of the need to have um, a bit of a break. We've got one more, we've got one more hour left. And either we can sort of have a break for lunch and then flow over a bit on to tomorrow. Um, so I think we, uh, yeah, I think I think we need to have we need to have a fifteen minute break. Um, I'm going to get myself some lunch and then we'll sprint. Um, we'll sprint to the finish line with OmniPerf and some and perhaps some CUDA profiling tools as well. All right, so we're now, we are now back. And now um, hopefully we've had enough of a, enough of a break. Um, yeah, certainly wasn't, certainly wasn't enough for, for me, but, <laughs> but what I'm going to do is just sprint to the finish and then we can, then we can head off for the day. Okay. So just uh, just a few thoughts. What did everyone think of um, Omnitrace? Yep. Now there is there is more functionality there um, with Omnitrace to collect specific performance counters, but you do need uh, you, you do need a configuration file and then in that configuration file, that's where you specify the hardware performance counters that you want to collect. So I didn't cover that aspect of Omnitrace, but I would defer that uh, to AMD specific 
training that um, that uses OmniTrace. So let's move on now to OmniPerf. So I'll share my screen again. Okay, the AMD research tool OmniPerf is a powerful tool for measuring the performance of applications on AMD Instinct GPUs like the MI250X on Sotonix. So it can perform feats like a roofline analysis. So we're going to load the OmniPerf modules using the commands in the welcome letter. Um, and you can use this command, OmniPerf profile, to make an analysis. So OmniPerf, um, I believe it uses RockProf um, to collect the hardware performance counters and then does a better, a more thorough job at marshalling that information and presenting it. Yep, so that's what OmniPerf does. And we can run OmniPerf using something like this. So we're back out into our L5 profiling directory. All right. So now I'm going to use OmniPerf profile to collect profiling and hardware performance counter information on our application. Now at the moment, OmniPerf only works for the AMD Instinct line of processors. I think I think it does also work for the MI one hundreds, but in a less um, less exhaustive capacity. So the MI two hundreds is the architecture that AMD is looking to support with this experimental tool at this time. So we've done our collection. So we've run the application multiple times using OmniPerf and we've collected um, lots of performance information. Now, if we use the analyze mode, so we've done the profile mode and that has put everything into a directory called workloads. So we go CD to workloads and then we go CD to mat malts, which is the name of our collection. CD to MI200, there is a number of files in here from, from the collection. So I'll just go back out of that directory. All right, so when we want to analyze the results, we can use this command, which will analyze the results collected. And that's gonna spit the output into a file called analysis.txt. So we're just waiting for that to be done. All right, so let's have a look at analysis.txt. And I will increase the size of my terminal. So it's got a number of fields in the, um, in the analysis text file. And that's sort of rendered using ASCII art sort of uh, tables. So we've got the kernel name, uh, the number of nanoseconds it took to run, and the percentage of time. We've got things like fields like system info, uh, the number of um, hardware things like the number of hardware threads in a wavefront, the next maximum number of wavefronts that you can have active per compute unit, uh, the maximum number of threads you can have in a block, and information on the L1, L2 cache, for example. 
Okay, um, so the system speed of light is, I think, um, metrics on how fast things go. So this was how fast, um, yeah, this was how fast the computation can go in in respect of the peak performance of the machine. So the peak performance is something like 20, 23 teraflops for an individual uh, graphics uh, compute die. And that's how many gigaflops we actually achieved. So that's um, that's floating point performance, and that is uh, that's integer performance there. This MFMA is the matrix, the matrix um, performance, and we, we didn't do any matrix operations here. So that's the that is some fields on how fast it is performing compared to how fast it could theoretically perform. So this field here, field in table five, that has got the number of um, fields like the number of cycles that it was busy per kernel and the, the utilization. So in this particular in this particular um, application, we were using all of the um, all of the available wavefronts. Um, so we kept the kept the CPU 100 percent busy. So if we're using a small problem, uh, we're only a certain fraction of the um, yeah, only a certain fraction of the available wavefronts could be used, then we wouldn't get 100% utilization. And you've got some other, other fields and other tables here with, with um, a lot of information there. So I'm not going to try and pretend to know what every one of those is, but um, that's the way that you can get an analysis of, um, of the output using using Omni, OmniPerf. Now there is, there is a way uh, to analyze all this information and put it into a, um, a web browser that you can also, you can also peruse. So if you ran this command OmniPerf analyze, that would run a web server and then with your web browser, you can go to a page and it is at uh, usually port 8050. And this is the page that that pops up. And so you've got some information here, such as the number of reads and writes to high bandwidth memory. Um, You've got the L2 cache, the number of reads, the number of writes, the latency in cycles. So it looks like the read latency from the L2 cache is 184 cycles. The write latency is about 200 cycles. So just some information on the hardware there. And then um, you've got other caches here and their, um, their read, read and write latency and I think we're also getting the L1 cache hit rate. So for example, we've got a 66% vector L1 cache hit rate. So that could, um, that's certainly an indicator that something could, could improve. Um, it is improving our L1 cache hit rate. Yeah, so we've got a lot of information here. Um, this particular plot is interesting because this is a roofline analysis. So I'm just going to go back to, just going to go back to the code and talk about, so the um, the teaching module and talk about roofline models. So the arithmetic intensity of an algorithm is the ratio of floating point operations computed per byte transferred. So this is either reads or writes. So that's the total number of 
floating point operations computed per byte transferred. So that helps us gauge if an algorithm is likely to be constrained by either the bandwidth or floating point performance of a compute resource. So in matrix multiplication, for example, just in our naive algorithm, uh, the input matrix A is of size N0C, N1A, and B is of size N1A, N1C. So every element of matrix C requires N1A loads from A, N1A loads from B, and one store to C. It also requires N1A multiplications and N1A additions. So the arithmetic intensity of matrix multiplication is 2 times N1A, so that's the number of flops, divided by 2 times N1A plus 1B, where B is the number of bytes that you choose to represent each element. So when N1A is large, the theoretical arithmetic intensity for matrix multiplication, or at least our naive version, is 1 over B, or 0 0.25. So if a processor has a peak floating point performance of FP flops per second, and one of those caches uh, either global memory, L2 cache, or L1 cache, if one of those caches can feed the processor at a peak bandwidth of BP bytes per second, then you can calculate a floating point limit that is dependent on memory bandwidth. So this floating point limit, or FB, is your arithmetic intensity, so flops per byte, times the uh, bandwidth of whatever cache is feeding that algorithm. So if your algorithm, if your hardware can do BP bytes per second, and then your arithmetic intensity of your algorithm is A flops per byte, then a, a floating point limit um, is actually A times BP flops per second. So that is a limit on the actual attainable floating point performance, and it will be the less of either FB or FP, which is your peak floating point performance. So whatever is lower. And you can find the point where those two so where those two sort of cross over, um, you, you can find the point where the two cross over. So if you have the arithmetic intensity on your x-axis and floating point performance on your y-axis, you can find the crossover point um, by setting FB to FP. And then you can solve for the arithmetic intensity. So that A is FP over BP. So this is, the, this is what a roofline model is then, is that the floating point performance, given an algorithm with arithmetic intensity A, is ABP if A is less than FP on BP, or it's FP otherwise. So that is our roofline, roofline model. So, for example, um, a single compute device, the single graphics compute device or a single um, HIP device on the MI250X GPU has a peak 32-bit floating point processing rate of about 23.95 teraflops per second and a peak bandwidth of 1.6 terabytes per second from global memory. So that is the um, that is that is from that is from global memory. So that's the sixty four gigabytes of global memory. So problems will then be constrained by memory bandwidth up to an arithmetic intensity of fifteen. So if your algorithm has an arithmetic intensity of less than fifteen, then it's going to be constrained by memory bandwidth. So here we go. Here's the roofline models 
for um, the naive uh, matrix um, multiplication. So here we have the, the limit on floating point performance as determined by your memory bandwidth. And this is the point where the two meet. And for arith arithmetic intensity above, above about 16, so that's, um, that is about here. Oh, sorry, above about here. Um, that beyond that, beyond that point, you're limited by the floating point performance of your processor. Okay, so it's saying it's saying about thirty. So I'm not sure why why that is, but um, we're expecting it around about this point, the point to cross over. So these points here are the um, the actual the floating point performance from the L1, L2, and um, from the um, from the high bandwidth memory. So we've got our arithmetic intensity um, associated with each of of those. So from our L1 cache, we're getting our expected arithmetic intensity of about um, close to 0 0.25. So what that means is that if we can shift the number of floating point operations that we do, if we can shift that, um, if we can shift that arithmetic intensity up, so if we can do more flops per byte of memory read, then we can shift this performance up this curve a little bit, and that would and that would improve our performance. So this shows uh, where our algorithm is currently doing in relation to how well it could do on the machine. So our arithmetic, sorry, our floating point performance right here is not um, is not very good um, because our arithmetic intensity for our naive algorithm is quite low. So it's in, you know, it's around 0 0.25. So it means that we have to change our algorithm in order to get better performance. So with the naive algorithm that we have, um, we're not going to get much better performance because um, we're loading things from the L1, L1 cache and the memory bandwidth from that is currently limiting, um, limiting our attainable floating point performance. So if we're able to shift the number of flops computed per byte, then we could go more in this direction and unlock higher levels of performance. So that this um, roofline analysis shows how well our application is doing compared to how well it could be doing. But yeah, so that's um, that's a really uh, important bit of information that's coming out of uh, OmniPerf. And if you just want PDF versions of the roofline models, then you can execute this command, omniperf profile and roof only. So that will generate PDF versions of these roofline models and put them in the workloads directory. Okay, so going back to the GUI, um, we've got our roofline models here. This one, this plot here is just the theoretical performance for 16-bit operations. So we don't have any 16-bit operations. So this plot here is just showing you what the roof lines are for 16. And I think there's even 8-bit operations there. Um, but this is the one that we want to look at because we've, we're using 32-bit 
um, using 32-bit um, arithmetic. So there's our crossover point for our L1 cache. There is our crossover point for our L2 cache. Um, and there's our crossover point for the high bandwidth memory. Oh, sorry. Sorry, there's our crossover point for the local data store, so shared memory. And there's our crossover point for high bandwidth memory. Okay, and it even shows you, um, it even shows you the uh, the the bandwidth there as being one point three teraflops. So I don't know why we are discrepant in the actual result there compared to what we have as one point six terabytes per second, but um, but nevertheless, um, yeah, nevertheless, that's what that's what OmniPerf is reporting. Okay, so moving down, we've got some other tables here. So statistics on the kernels. And as I was saying before, there's so there's all the tables now that we saw in the textual analysis with um, OmniPerf. And I think there's more there's more information coming soon. So OmniPerf is still under development. All right. So of course, because we are using, because we are using um, NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA hardware, at least on Hub One, we can do profiling with NVIDIA hardware as well. So on Hub One, on Hub One, we can go to the course material L5 profiling and open the profiling module. And I'm just going to talk about doing performance measurement with NVIDIA tools. So when when you're doing profiling with uh, with NVIDIA tools, um, the app the command line application NSYS can collect traces on that malt profiling.exe. So if we if we do that, so I'll just run. Oops, it says NSYS not found. Okay, so I might have to do that on my machine. So it looks like I've had a bit of a bit of an error. Um, with hub one, so NSYS is not available, not to worry. I will export HIP platform as equal to NVIDIA. So I'm just going to use the, the NVIDIA GPU on my laptop. And we're just gonna do, we're just gonna make our application. All right, so now we're using the NVIDIA backend on our on the laptop. And I'm just going to use NSYS, the NVIDIA systems tool, or the NSYTE profile to get a profile of my application. So using an NVIDIA tool. And the results are going to be in NSYS trace. And then I can use NSYS UI to have a look at that. So might not be happy running an X. Might not be happy running an X command inside a Jupyter terminal. So I'll just run this on the terminal. So I'll go NCCUI. Okay, so here is, yeah, so here is my, um, 
here's my application trace on an NVIDIA system. And I think I can zoom. Yep, I can zoom in on that. So just be aware that when you are using um, NVIDIA tools with an AMD, so NVIDIA tools with HIP, and the HIP is using the CUDA backend, just be aware that um, all the calls to HIP will actually be translated across to CUDA calls. So you still have you still have um, the kernel. So the kernel, yeah, you still have the kernel name, which is here. So here's where the kernel is, is being run. And so just zoom in. And so there's information on your kernel call there. So I've just used the NVIDIA tools uh, to profile our application um, using an NVIDIA backend. All right, so there's one more, there's one more tool that you can use. You can use NVIDIA Insight Compute, and that will collect information such as hardware performance counters. So that would be the NVIDIA equivalent of RockProf with hardware performance counters. And then I can use NCU UI, so that's the um, that's hardware collection with Insight Compute. So I can use N. Use NCU UI. So I'm just starting up. Yeah. So I'm just starting up NVIDIA Insight Compute, and that shows that shows me things like throughput, memory throughput. Um, our grid size, the number of registers per thread that we used, block sizes, the total number of threads, so occupancy. Um, did we did we keep did we keep the um, did we keep the total theoretical number of wavefronts going? Um, on the GPU compared to how many active wavefronts we could have had. So that's what occupancy is. And this shows us that our achieved occupancy is a bit, a bit less than, you know, is 50%, which is a bit less than, um, it's not ideal. So anyway, yeah, so NVIDIA Insight Compute is the equivalent of collecting hardware performance counter information. Okay, so in summary, this chapter covers how to measure performance in HIP applications um, using both um, NVIDIA backends, but also um, AMD uh, backends so with the AMD Rock Prof. So we did tracing with Rock Prof, and that worked very well. Um, we did we did um, trace collection with OmniTrace as well as performance collection with OmniPerf. And so the commands that we went through are the commands that you would use in order to collect that performance um, information for HIP programs. And then we just concluded by having a look at some of the NVIDIA tools to collect um, performance counter and um, tracing information if you were using the NVIDIA backend with HIP.